Middle East. The Middle East. Let's begin with a little bit of a, a flight of fancy, if you will. I want you all to imagine. Sit back and imagine. Imagine that you are all high-ranking American diplomats, and you have been assigned by your government to conduct a very sensitive negotiation with the emissary of an Arab country, a Middle Eastern country, that has declared war against the United States. And you have to go overseas, somewhere in Europe, and meet this emissary and convince this representative of the Arab country not to make war on the United States. So you leave, you go, you meet with them, and you make your case. You say the American people do not wish antagonism with any peoples of the Middle East, not with your people. American people merely want to conduct their trade freely without fear of uh, depredation. America wants peace with all the peoples of the Middle East. So, so you've made your case, and then imagine that this Middle Eastern ambassador turns to you and said, no, we want <coughs> war with you. Imagine if he says to you that we have a holy book, it's called the Quran, and the Quran tells us that we as good Muslims must wage war against all infidel states. The United States is an infidel state, and therefore we must wage unremitting battle against you. And if any of our soldiers are killed in the conduct of this war, then they will immediately light to paradise. So having heard this response, what then is your recommendation to the U.S. government? Well, if your recommendation that the United States has no choice but to defend itself that the United States has no choice but to go to war in the Middle East, then your recommendation would have echoed that of precisely the first American high-ranking diplomat to conduct such an operation. And his name was Thomas Jefferson. And the month was March, the year was 1785, and Jefferson was sent to London to meet with the representative of the Pasha of Tripoli in what is today Libya, a gentleman by the name of Abdul Rahman Najjar. And Tripoli was one of the four so-called Barbary states, along with Algiers, what is today Algeria, Tunis, Tunisia, and Morocco, which were pirate states, state-sponsored pirates. They would send their pirate ships out into the Mediterranean, and they would attack American merchant vessels, and they would plunder their cargoes and enslave their crews. And America was forced to confront this, and they had sent Thomas Jefferson to try to negotiate, and Eric Thomas Jefferson had talked about peace, and Abdul Rahman al said, no, precisely the words that I gave you. We have a holy book called the Quran, and it tells us we must wage war against you. It's in his report, it's in Jefferson's report to Congress. Now this was very, very bad news for the United States. America had very complicated relationships with the Barbary states. Morocco, you should know, was the first foreign nation to recognize the United States after it declared independence. America's second treaty after the American-Franco Treaty of 1777 is with Morocco. It has Thomas Jefferson's signature on it, John Adams, and a signature in Arabic and a Hijra date, believe it or not, America's second treaty. But after the conclusion of the American Revolution in 1783, America found itself alone. It was no longer protected by the British Navy. And America didn't have a navy to protect itself from the Barbary pirates who were attacking American crews. And that was just the beginning of the bad news. America had emerged from the Revolutionary War without any gunships. Nope, they were all sold, captured, um, sunk by the British. And America didn't even have the means of creating naval power. Because back in the 1780s, those 13 former colonies, now states, were loosely confederated under the Articles of Confederation. They had no central government. They had no means of raising taxes to create America, the Navy. And so in the face of the Barbary pirate threat, America was defenseless. And about 20% of America's trade went to the Middle East. America had a very delicate economy back then, a huge war debt. The Middle East actually posed a mortal threat to the nascent United States. Now in the face of that threat, Many Americans said, let's not create a navy, it's too expensive. Let's just follow that time-honored European custom of paying off the pirates. They called it paying tribute, rather euphemistically. And during the presidency of John Adams, America was paying about 20% of its federal budget in bribes to Barbary pirates. But there was one American leader among that founding father's generation who took a different stance, and his name was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson believed that the Barbary states, not being democratic states, would never honor any treaty. You'd just pay them bribes and you'd get more piracy in return. He believed that the American people had a temper, as he called it, 
which distinguished them from Europeans. Americans did not abide by playing back mail to anybody. And he believed that America should have a, what he called an erect, erect and independent attitude in foreign policy. He told, he said, the America should create a navy, America should go to war, but Jefferson was very much in the minority. The majority of Americans were afraid, feared getting bogged down in an open-ended, potentially bloody war in the distant Middle East. Today, nearly 230 years later, Americans are confronting some of the same questions in their relations with the Middle East. Should they try to negotiate with their enemies in the region? Should they reach out to them? Or should they confront them, and if they can, should they defeat them? Today, over two centuries after this, I think many Americans, many people in this room would be surprised to learn that not just Thomas Everson, John Jefferson, John Adams had major issues with the Middle East, had major Middle Eastern policies, so too did Andrew Jackson, so too did Abraham Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson. Many Americans today would be very surprised to learn that Lincoln had not just the Middle Eastern policy, but one of the people implicated in the assassination plot against Lincoln, and we're observing his 200th birthday, right? One of the people implicated in the assassination plot against Lincoln was escaped to and was arrested later in Egypt. And he was actually extradited by Egypt to the United States to stand trial here. Many people would be surprised to know that 500 Egyptian soldiers fought on North American soil during the Civil War. Would be surprised to hear think that the original lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner spoke of humbled Muslims bowing down to the victorious flag of the United States. Imagine standing up for that one you know, before ball games. <laughs> Rather politically incorrect, now wouldn't it? Or that the original Statue of Liberty showed a veiled Arab woman holding a torch. Now, yes. <laughs> See? Surprise. Because many Americans think that America's involvement in the Middle East began sometime in the aftermath of World War II with the advent of the Arab Israeli conflict, America's dependence on oil. And I say most Americans because I would have included myself in that category. Once upon a time, I thought America's involvement began sometime in the Truman administration, the early Eisenhower administration. And then one day, this is getting to be quite a long time ago, when I was in graduate school and studying Arab history, I had a teacher who was giving a course on the emergence of modern Egypt, and he mentioned rather parenthetically that in the late 1860s, a group of former Civil War officers, Confederate and Union officers together, were sent by the U.S. Army, by Tecumseh Sherman, to go to Egypt to modernize the Egyptian army. And when these officers got to Egypt, they found that most of the Egyptian armies, including their officers, were illiterate. And so they began to build literacy schools. And the next day, these Egyptian officers showed up with their children, and so these veterans of Vicksburg and Gettysburg got into the business of teaching Egyptian school kids how to read and write. And while they were at it, they said, well, we might as well import, impart to these Egyptians some American ideas. What were the ideas they imparted? Patriotism, civic virtues, as they were called back then, and democracy. Americans teaching democracy in the Middle East in 1869. And I'm sitting in a graduate school class, and I'm thinking, boy, that's really interesting. Americans in the Middle East in the 1860s. So at the first opportunity, I went up to the library to read more about it. And to my chagrin, I found that there were a number of books about Britain in the Middle East, France in the Middle East. There was no book about America in the Middle East. And certainly no book that would put these officers' extraordinary experience in Egypt in the 1860s within any type of meaningful historical context. Flash ahead some years to the aftermath of 9-11, suddenly Americans were extensively, if not existentially, engaged in the Middle East. They were going to make decisions that were going to impact their lives and the lives of many people around the world, and they had no historical context in which to make these decisions. And so, several weeks after 9-11, I'm sitting with a good friend of mine who just happens to be my editor in New York, and he leans across the dinner table and says, okay, Michael, what is the one book about the Middle East that has not been written, but which absolutely must be written? And I didn't hesitate a nanosecond, and I said, America in the Middle East. And he said, very good. He took out a pencil, he flipped over the, over the menu, on the back of the menu, he wrote out an outline, and I signed a contract, and then my problems began. <laughs> my previous book, 
before this one was a book about the 1967 Six Day War. 400 pages, about six days. Now I have contracted to write about 230 years of history. How? How? Anybody's name was I going to get a handle on this? And it occurred to me early on that the only way that one could approach such a, a massive topic was by identifying the underlying themes that somehow bound together this extraordinary and long legacy of America's involvement in the Middle East. And the first theme that I identified was a theme I think that would be very familiar to anybody here, and that's the theme of power. And by power, I mean the pursuit of America's vital interests in the Middle East by the application of American power, whether it be military power, economic power, diplomatic power. Power certainly described the situation that existed between the United States and those Barbary states in the 1780s. By the spring of 1787, there were 121 American hostages in Barbary. Imagine if we had 120 American hostages in the Middle East today. What kind of national crisis we'd be in? And again, America had no means of combating this because they didn't have a federal government, didn't have a navy. And so when representatives of the states convened in Philadelphia in May of that year to discuss the possibility of creating a constitution, the Barbary pirate issue loomed very, very large indeed. And if you go into the ratification debates, you'll see the transcripts of representatives from maritime New England, which had extensive trade relations with the Middle East, getting up and saying, folks, we don't have a constitution, we don't have a federal government, we don't have a federal government, we don't have a navy, if we don't have a navy, the Barbary pirates are going to kill our commerce, and we're going to die as a nation. But if you went much further south to Georgia, the Carolinas, you would see representatives in the ratification debates getting up and saying, if we don't have a constitution, we can't have a federal government, we don't have a federal government, we don't have a navy, we don't have a navy, we're going to have Algerines, as they were called back then, Algerines landing on the shores of Georgia and Carolina and kidnapping our sons and daughters, and we're going to die as a nation. And so by marshalling this mortal Middle Eastern threat, the founders of this country were able to take 13 disparate states and coalesce them into a united state, a singular as opposed to a plural noun. They were able to get these states to create uh, power for the first time and project that power. Five years after the signing of the Constitution, 1794, the Congress signed a bill, passed a bill, signed into law by George Washington, creating the U.S. Navy. They allocated $688,000.44 for the creation of the U.S. Navy. And America went to war. America went to war in the Middle East. America's first foreign war, the America's longest foreign military engagement were the Barbary Wars, roughly from 1790s, with many, many setbacks, by the way. It wasn't until 1805 that a group of American Marines led a larger band of mercenaries 500 miles across the Libyan desert to attack Tripoli from behind, to the shores of Tripoli, that's where it comes from. It wasn't until 1815 that Stephen Decatur, for whom 27 cities and towns are named in this country, Decatur, Illinois, Decatur, Georgia, sailed a U.S. fleet into Algiers and Tripoli Harbor, and he vanquished these pirates at Cannon Point. And so America learned some of its primary lessons in power from the Middle East and from its dealings with the Middle East. And by creating a navy not to rule the waves, the British sense, but to free those waves, the United States opened up the sea lanes to the Middle East to the agents of American faith. Now, faith would be the second great theme that binds this long and disparate narrative of America and the Middle East. Faith, in the American context, has two sides to it. Think of it as a coin. There is a civic, secular side. This is the side of a Puritan New England that conceived of itself as a city on the hill that thought of this new nation of America in a unique way. It was going to come into being to guarantee not liberty not only for its own citizens, but to project freedom throughout the world. It really had never been a state like it, a revolutionary context. But the flip side of the civic faith is a purely religious faith. It is a Protestant faith, which is concerned not only with the freedom of humanity, but the redemption of humanity. Who were those Puritans? The Puritans were a dissenting Protestant sect in 17th century England that had suffered terribly at the hands of the uh, ruling Church of England. 
And in an attempt to cope better with their suffering in England, the Puritans quite naturally looked back into their Bible. They looked first into their New Testament, and they didn't find that model, so they looked further back. They looked back into those books that had been systematically downplayed uh, by Christianity throughout the previous 15 centuries. They looked back into what they called the Old Testament. And there they found something extraordinary. They found a God who spoke directly to his people in their language. And he promised to rescue them from exile, to restore them to their promised land. The Puritans read this story, and they loved this story. They embraced it. They became the new Israel, the new Jews. All of a sudden, England became the new Egypt. The Atlantic Ocean became the new Sinai. They escaped from England slash Egypt. They escaped across the Atlantic slash Sinai. And they landed in a new world, a new promised land. And they immediately took the map of the old promised land and imposed it on the new one. That's why if you're not in this area of the country, but from where we come from out east, you got about a thousand city and place names that are from the Bible. You have your Jerichos and your Bethlehems and your Beth Pages and your Bethany, especially if you're in Long Island, New Canaan, Connecticut. All those Hebrew names come right from the Bible. And they made Hebrew a mandatory language at their universities. You know this? You know James Madison was a Hebrew major at Princeton? And he failed. <laughs> he spent an extra year at Princeton. They put Hebrew in the logo of Yale. They put Hebrew in the logo of Dartmouth and Columbia. Uh, so closely identified were the founding father generations with this biblical Hebrew narrative that the conclusion of the American Revolution, 1783, there was a heated debate among the American leaders over what was going to be the great symbol of the United States. And there was a group of American leaders that thought the symbol should be the American bald eagle clutching 13 arrows in its talons, one for each state. You may be familiar with that seal. But another group of prominent Americans said no, that the seal of the United States should show Moses leading the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt and into the Promised Land. And a big debate in Congress. America came this close to having Moses as its national symbol. <laughs> but you should know that that symbol showing Moses leading the children out of the Israel out of bondage was designed by Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. That's how closely identified they were with this notion. Now, for many of these American Christians, this notion that they were the new Jews meant that they had a certain kinship relationship with the old Jews, us. They were mishpocha. They didn't necessarily like the mishpocha, but they loved them. And they uh, had a strong attachment to, uh, to the old promised land, then known as Palestine, part of the Ottoman Empire. And they concluded that to be good Christians, to be good Americans, it was their divinely ordained duty to help restore those Jews to their old promised land, to fulfill God's biblical promises to those Jews. And they became the restorationists. And restorationism wasn't a, a minority idea in America. It was very, very prevalent. Uh, John Adams, the second president, said that it was his greatest wish that 100,000 Jewish soldiers as well-disciplined as the French army, this is the French army in 1796, mind you, would march back into Palestine and reclaim it as a Judean kingdom. Abraham Lincoln in 1863 said restoring the Jews to their holy land was a dream that was cherished by a great many Americans that he Lincoln would personally help realize that dream once he had restored America's unity after the Civil War. Perhaps the greatest single expression of this restoration idea occurs in a book published in 1844 called Visions of the Valley. Visions of the Valley uh, calls on the United States government to send the Navy back to the Middle East not to fight pirates this time, but to detach Palestine physically from the Ottoman Empire and give it back to the Jews. And Visions of the Valley becomes an antebellum bestseller. It sells a million copies, goes through three, 30 printings. Huh? And the author of Visions of the Valley is the head of the Hebrew language department of New York University. NYU graduates here? Hang your heads high here. And his name was Professor George Bush. And, uh, two days in the genealogy department of the Library of Congress, and they believe to ascertain that that Professor George Bush of 1844 was a forebear of two later American presidents of the same name. That's how deep, far back this goes back. Now, for many of these American Christians, merely envisioning, dreaming about this recreated Jewish state was insufficient. Many of them thought that physically they should go to Palestine and help the Jews reconstitute themselves there. So starting in the 1830s, groups of Americans went to Palestine to create colonies there, 
Many American women, by the way, Clarinda Minor of Washington, Harriet Livermore of Philadelphia, all of these colonies had the same extraordinary goal. They were all designed to teach the Jews how to farm. These Americans were good Jeffersonians. Jefferson believed that the basis of any modern state was an agrarian economy. The Jews had been cut off from their land for 2,000 years. They'd forgotten how to farm. And therefore, it was the duty of these Americans to reacquaint the Jews with agrarian life. And they went to Palestine, made these colonies, and discovered very quickly that the Jews did not want to learn how to farm. <laughs> not from them, anyway. And they suffered terribly from starvation and disease and attack, exposure. They died in the dozens. They died in droves. They didn't stop them. They kept on coming. 1855, Philip Dixon, his wife and twin daughters, leave Groton, Massachusetts, and they moved to an abandoned hillside in Jaffa, rather optimistically christened Mount Hope. And the twin daughters, Dixon daughters, marry two German Lutheran brothers who are also restorationists, and their names are Johann and Frederick Grosteinbeck. And together, the Dixons and the Grosteinbecks have this farm, find out that the Jews do not want to learn how to farm for them, and they're suffering from Bedouin attacks, and they starve, and they're in the mud and the cold. But still, another wave came. In 1866, a gentleman by the name of George Adams from Indian River, Maine, picks up with 157 of his followers. They move to another abandoned hillside outside of Jaffa. You can still go to downtown Jaffa and see two 1867 clappered houses in the middle of downtown Jaffa. They brought 17 of these prefabs with them. And they try to set up this colony to teach the Jews how to farm, and they contracted the plague, and dozens of them died. And yet it did not discourage in any way this restorationist notion. It was so deeply ingrained in that faith-guided approach to America's relationship with the Middle East, and it gave birth to an entirely different movement in America's involvement in this region, one that would have a profound impact on the political evolution of the Middle East. In 1818, America's two, two of America's first missionaries to the Middle East, Pliny Fisk and Levy Parsons, gave their departing sermon in Old South Church in Boston, home to Paul Revere, the Minuteman. And they get up there in Old South Church and they tell the congregation that they're going off to the Middle East with several goals. One, they want to ingather the Jews into Palestine so that the Jews will then have a state, and once they have a state, they will convert en masse to Congregationalist Protestantism. And failing that, they want to convert the Muslim Arabs to Christianity. So, Plenty Fisk, Levi Parsons, leave Boston, they go to the Middle East, they find very quickly that the Jews do not want to ingather under their auspices, find the Jews do not want to become Congregationalists, <laughs> and they find that if they try to convert the Muslim Arabs, they will lose their heads. Proselytizing <laughs> under the Ottoman law is a capital offense. So, in frustration, Fisk and Parsons turn to building schools. They build the first modern western style elementary and secondary schools in what is today Syria and Lebanon. And successive waves of missionaries come to the Middle East, transform these schools in what will become the first western style universities in the Middle East. What well, are today the American University of Beirut, the American University of Cairo. And in these universities, these purveyors of American <coughs> religious faith switched over to the civic side. And what did they begin to teach in these universities? Civic values, patriotism, democracy. And they become the champions of an entirely new idea in the Middle East, an entirely new identity, the identity of Arab nationalism. And it's not a religious identity. Christians can join, Jews can join. Muslims, it's a communality of religion, of, 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 of language and history and culture. And the sons and grandsons of these missionaries, speaking Arabic, become the great championship, champions of Arab liberation, first from Ottoman rule, then from European rule. And the irony of the irony is after World War I, when the goals of Arab nationalism, of creating an Arab state in the Middle East, including in Palestine, become irreconcilable with the goals of restorationism, now known by its modern name of Zionism, which is creating a Jewish state in Palestine, you have one group of restorationists promoting Jewish statehood, another group of restorationists or the descendants going against Jewish statehood, and that battle goes on to this day. Through the State Department, read recommend this particularly highly, but if you read Jimmy Carter's book, here's a person who is very much inspired by his Christian faith, who has great criticisms of Israel. I think he actually has a problem with the very existence of a Jewish state. And you have the descendants of those other restorationists, which who are today the evangelical Americans, who are about 70 million people in this country, who are among Israel's most prominent supporters in this country. And that debate continues. And what's interesting for me as an historian is that they both emanate from the same faith-guided approach.
to America's involvement in the Middle East. And then finally, I discovered a third theme. And in many ways, it's the most tantalizing theme. It's the most elusive theme. It's the theme of fantasy. Now, you all know these things. If you grew up in the movies that we grew up with, if you grew up with I Dream of Genie, you know these fantasies, right? Okay? It's the fantasies of genies that come out and say, Master, Master, whatever you wish. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's carpets orbiting minarets. It's veiled but available harem girls. Lots of harem girls. It's a highly eroticized fantasy of this region of the world. And what's interesting is that many of these fantasies, certainly in colonial times, uh, originated in one book. And it was the second most popular book on the American colonial bookshelf after the Bible. Though you usually don't, you didn't keep it on the same bookshelf with the Bible, at least you didn't keep it in full display, because the book was, even by 21st century standards, rather pornographic. The book was The Thousand and One Arabian Nights. Now, it's actually a collection of Persian medieval tales, rather ribald, and you know some of the stories. You know Scheherazade, and you know Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, and Aladdin and Sinbad <coughs> the Sailor. Really risque stuff. And for many Americans, this was their sole source of information on the Middle East. They read this book, and they thought that this is what the Middle East really looked like. There really were genies. There really were flying carpets. And many of them were inspired, uh, if not lured, to leave their frontier cabins and don't go westward, go eastward. Not toward the Mississippi, but toward the Jordan and the Nile and the Tigris to see this land for themselves. Now, one of those early American travelers, actually the first American traveler, was a gentleman named John Ledyard who was, in his, his own right, an extraordinary war man. He had traveled around the world with Captain Cook. Probably had seen more to the planet than any American of his day. He had lived with the Iroquois for 10 years. A very good friend of Thomas Jefferson. And it's actually through his correspondence with Jefferson that we see what the Middle East looked like to an American who lands in Egypt in 1788. That's when Ledger landed in Egypt. He was going to explore Egypt. And what he saw there disappointed him. He found, much to his disappointment that the Middle East bore no resemblance whatsoever to a thousand and one nights. <laughs> it was poor, it was backward, it was intolerant, very, Americans are truly very upset the fact that, that Middle Eastern women are treated the way they were under Islam. And he has, he has nothing good to say about the Middle East with one exception. Ledger looked out into the desert and he saw Bedouin, nomads. And he wrote to Jefferson that these nomads are a lot like our frontiersmen in Pennsylvania and in Western Ohio. Why? Because like our frontiersmen, they loved liberty. They didn't like to have any government on their heads. They wanted to be freemen. And unfortunately, these particular frontiersmen of the desert were laboring under an Ottoman tyranny. But Ledyard speculated if some Western power would come along and remove that Ottoman oppression, like the United States, then these liberty-loving nomads of the desert would rise up and embrace American-style democracy. 1788, friends. Didn't start in George Bush. Way back. Way back. Ledyard's letters, though very dispiriting about the Middle East, had the exact opposite impact of Americans. It didn't discourage them from going to the Middle East. By the 19th century, the Americans actually surpassed the Europeans as the number one source of tourism in the Middle East. You have all these Englishmen writing about postcards of complaint about the brash Americans who have taken up all the good uh, hotel rooms in Damascus. And the trip to the Middle East becomes almost a, a source of, of prestige. You can't be a prominent American and not go to the Middle East. So Ulysses Grant goes to the Middle East. Tecumseh Sherman goes to the Middle East. Frederick Douglass goes to the Middle East. Ralph Waldo Emerson goes to the Middle East. Um, it becomes a source of inspiration for artists and painters. In 1856, a author from New England whose previous book, Moby Dick, had only sold 3,000 copies, was very depressed, needed a place to go and get a new inspiration for a travel-type novel. So in December 1856, Herman Melville packed two shirts and a toothbrush and went off to the Middle East. And if you read his travel memoirs, and they're great, I, I, I strongly recommend them. They're, they're, Postmodern and vaguely hallucinogenic. Um, he has nothing good to say about them. It doesn't bear any resemblance to A Thousand and One Nights. He's depressed, horrible. And still, artists keep coming. Ten years later, 1867, another aspiring artist uh, whose name was Samuel Clemens gets a contract from two papers in the United States to report, to publish his collective dispatches of a trip to the Middle East. 
and he goes to the Middle East, and he, collect, he publishes these collective dispatches under the omnibus title of Innocence Abroad. For the first time, he uses a pen name. He calls himself Mark Twain. And Innocence Abroad becomes the number one non-fiction bestseller of the second half of the 19th century. It makes Mark Twain a very wealthy man. And it has nothing good to say about the Middle East. One thing you have to say about, middle, about Mark Twain, he's an equal opportunity hater. He hates <laughs> Arabs, he hates Jews, but he also hates Americans. He talks about all the American tourists in the Middle East who go around chipping off pieces of pyramids with sledgehammers. He calls them American vandals. Brutal. But Americans kept coming, the thousands. And by the beginning of the 20th century, Middle Eastern fantasies, taken directly out of <laughs> Thousand and One Nights, become the stuff of the burgeoning Hollywood industry. And some of Hollywood's earliest blockbusters are Middle Eastern fantasies. The Sheikh of Araby, 1921, starring the soon-to-be-famous Rudolph Valentino, about the, 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 the black-clad Bedouin who sweeps out of the desert on his steed and sweeps up some innocent damsel and takes him off to an oasis to ravish her. The hit song of 1921, on the Sheikh of Araby, my heart belongs to thee, at night when you're asleep, and to your tent I creep. <laughs> and Amer Hollywood produced dozens and dozens of these movies. I'm teaching this course now at Georgetown in America, at least every lecture begins with two or three cuts of films, and they're timed each level. We're up to the 1960s now, and I am showing I Dream of Junie. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and it continued. It continued with uh, you know very recent movies, Hidalgo, Sahara, uh, Middle Eastern fantasy movies, and so permeated was the American imagination by these fantasies that America, many Americans, were nonplussed when, in September of 2001, some of these romantic, berobed uh, Bedouins left their oases, left their balmy camel oases, and came to America to hijack jets and to fly them into the Pentagon and fly them into the Twin Towers. So power, faith, and fantasy. These were the three themes that I found that bound together this extraordinary legacy of America's in the Middle East. And sometimes they appear as separate entities. And you talk about the Barbie Pirates being an example of power, or John Ledger's your fantasy, or Pliny Fisk being an example of faith. More often than not, they're engaged in some type of dynamic interchange with one another, often in, in conflict with one another. For example, uh, power meets faith in 1903, when Teddy Roosevelt sends destroyers into Beirut Harbor to threaten the Ottoman government there that is, he claims is mistreating missionaries. How about fantasy meets uh, faith in 1857, when Herman Melville visits the Dixon Farm in Palestine. And in his memoirs, he writes about how depressing this farm is and how the Jews don't want to learn a farm and how they're living in mud. And a month later, after Melville left this farm, he went home and wrote a poem called <coughs> Clarel, which I don't recommend. It's 27,000 lines wrong. Yeah. I don't. But in Clarel, it tells a story about the farm. And at the end of the story, there is a, uh, a story about a rape of the farm. The Bedouin bandits uh, broke into the farm and destroyed it. And this story actually is based on truth. A month after he left, Bedouin bandits finally broke into the Dixon farm and they knocked Philip Dixon on the head mortally. He's actually buried across the street from my office in Jerusalem in the Protestant cemetery. They raped brutally his wife and twin daughters. Frederick Grossteinbeck, one of the two Germans, was shot in the groin and died a long and agonizing death. And the only person to escape unscathed from the attack was Johann Grossteinbeck, whom according to consular records, uh, left Palestine at that point, moved to California to prospect for gold and Americanized his name. And though the treatment of this rape scene is not so successful in the Clarel poem, it merits a more, I think, successful treatment in a later work of literature by another great American writer. Uh, the rape scene in East of Eden, written by John Steinbeck III, the grandson of Johann Graf Steinbeck, uh, has a rape scene, which according to Steinbeck experts is a direct reference to the rape of the Dixon farm. And so fantasy meets Faith. And he made faith again in 1867 when the boat carrying Mark Twain out of Palestine evacuated the 47 survivors of the George Adam colony. And perhaps the only non caustic part of Innocence Abroad is when Twain describes the plight of these poor people being evacuated off the Jaffa <coughs> Beach. Um, faith trumped power in 1917 when Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, had to decide whether to declare war 
against the Ottoman Empire. You know that America went to war against Germany and Bulgaria, the central powers in Austria in World War I. <coughs> Turkey was part of the central power. Britain and France declared war against Turkey, but the United States debated whether or not to do that. And the reason why they were debating it was because Wilson, who was the grandson and son and nephew of Presbyterian ministers, was very close to the missionaries in the Middle East. And the missionaries came to Wilson and said, if you declare war against the Turks, the Turks are going to do to our people what they're doing to the Armenians. The Turks were are massacring the Armenians. And Wilson decided not to go to war against the Turks, which, if you ask me, was probably one of, if not the most, faithful decision ever taken by an American president in the Middle East because at the end of the war, Britain and France had hundreds of soldiers in the Middle East. America had not one trooper in the Middle East. And guess which countries got to design the post-war map of the Middle East? Britain and France. America didn't have much of a role in it. Faith trumped power again in 1948. May 1948, when on May 14th, America, the state of Israel was set to come into being after the UN had created a Jewish, had partitioned Palestine into an Arab and Jewish state. And the president had to decide whether to recognize that state. And on May 12th, the president met with his senior policy advisors, uh, with George Marshall, the Secretary of State, the most revered American of his generation, said to the president, Mr. President, you recognize that Jewish state? The Arabs are going to cut off oil to the West. Europe's going to fall to the communists. American troops are going to have to intervene in Palestine to save the Jews there. It was amazing. There's never been a case like this in American history. Where the entire foreign policy establishment said to the president, if you recognize this Jewish state, a global cataclysm will ensue. And the president listened to this and said, thank you. The president's name was Harry Truman. And Harry Truman went into the White House for the next 48 hours. He locked himself in there. He was an avid diarist. He wrote nothing in his diary. We don't know what through his, what went through his head. All we know is that at 6, 11 p.m. <coughs> Washington time, 11 minutes after Israel declared its independence, Harry Truman recognized the Jewish state, became the, made America the first state on earth to recognize the Jewish state. Why would he do such a thing? Why would he go against the advice of George Marshall? George Marshall said he wouldn't even vote for Harry Truman if he would recognize the Jewish state in the 1948 presidential elections. We don't know. The answer is we don't know because he wrote nothing in his diary. All we know is that about a week later there was a, des there was a, a delegation of dignitaries visiting the White House and they ran smack into Truman in the hall and the Delegation leader said, this is the president who helped create the Jewish state, and Truman took exception to it. He was insulted. He says, help create the Jewish state? <coughs> what do you mean, help create the Jewish state? I'm Cyrus, he said. Cyrus, those of you who don't know your Bible, being the ancient Persian king who, rec rec who rec rescued the Jews from exile, restored them to the Holy Land. Harry Truman, a strict Baptist, had memorized the Bible by age 15, was faith-guided, faith-trumped power. 1948 was the big watershed year. That is the year not only of the beginning of the Arab-Israeli conflict, it was the year that America woke up and found out that it was dependent on Middle Eastern oil. It was the year the Cold War came to the Middle East. And from that point on, American presidents, American policymakers have to struggle mightily to try to reconcile these impulses of power, faith, and fantasy. And they don't succeed at it. There's a lot of zigzagging. Eisenhower administration, 1953, joins with the British to oust a popular Iranian Prime Minister named Mohammad Mossadegh, whom the British and the Americans thought was getting too close to the Soviets in the Cold War. Three years later, the same Eisenhower administration goes against the British in the Suez Crisis to save another popular nationalist leader in the Middle East, Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, who was getting very close to the Soviets. Same administration. My favorite zigzag, Ronald Reagan, in the 1980s. Ronald Reagan in the mid-1980s sold missiles to the Iranians in an attempt to induce them to take fewer American hostages in Lebanon, basically violating Thomas Jefferson's first rule that the more, more you give to the pirates, the more piracy you're going to get. And since 1979, America has been involved militarily almost uninterruptedly in the Middle East. It's like a 30-year war. And we see the impact even in, in the uniforms that our service women and men wear. You go into airports, I just came from Chicago today, I saw soldiers dressed in the, in the colors of my hometown, of Jerusalem. You know, it's, it's actually the camouflage, which is more from Vietnam green in the 70s to sort of Arabian brown today. And then in 2003, America invaded Iraq. And there was one gleaming moment there, one gleaming moment there where it all seemed to come together. Here were the agents of American power, servicemen and women, patrolling the streets of Baghdad, which is the fabled city of a thousand and one nights, and they were there to impart American ideas of democracy, 
to a people who many believe were very eager to rise up and embrace those ideas. Since 2003, the situation has become very complicated indeed. Today, American policymakers, President Obama, are going to have to strive assiduously to try to reconcile the pursuit and preservation of America's vital interests in the Middle East while upholding American ideals in the Middle East, all the while striving to separate fantasy from reality in the Middle East. And it is not, not an easy task. America has to, America, this current administration has to have to decide that in reaching out to Iran, for example, a basically faith-guided interest, that Iran could utilize and exploit that process to complete its nuclearization, which would be a catastrophe for American power interests in the Middle East, a threat to America's vital allies in the Middle East, has to decide whether reaching out to Syria, again, another strategic interest, will conflict with America's support for democracy in Lebanon, because the Syrians want to dominate Lebanon. They don't want to continue that. America has to decide to distinguish between faith and power, and again, the most, I think the most difficult one is the, the question of distinguishing reality, uh, fantasies from reality in the Middle East. Can America disattach itself from this area? Can you disengage? Can you bring your soldiers home with the faith that the Middle East is not going to follow you? Can there really be disengagement from the Middle East? Is that the reality? Now, the truly depressing thing that is in my book, there are no answers to this question. Um, one of my major inspirations for the book was to just share the fascination uh, with this extraordinary story, uh, to tell you why the original lyrics of the Star Spangled Banner talked about Muslims bowing down to the victorious flag of the United States, why the original uh, Statue of Liberty showed a veiled Arab woman holding a torch, uh, those who haven't read the book, to get the answer to those questions, you're just going to have to go into that book. Uh, but at the end of the day, the inspiration, the impulse, was to create a context. A context of history, a context of the past, in which Americans who today, as much as any time in their history, will have to make some very important decisions in the Middle East, a context of the past, in which you, all of you, can begin to chart your future.